starting to record us now. Um, but hello, everybody. Um, my name is Allison Samuels, and I'm here on behalf of the Level Up Project, which is an initiative that I officially began over the last few months, but is something that in many forms has been on my mind for years. I am still honestly in a bit of shock that this is actually happening right now, that all of you are here and that hundreds of people around the country and world are participating in this project, which, it, which we launched not even a month ago. It is truly humbling. I am beyond thrilled to welcome you all to our very first ever workshop week with the Level Up Project and supporting our vision of accessible education, knowledge sharing, and networking. As all of us at the project have an innate sense that the industries we work within need to change and that we are individually responsible for helping that shift along. It is through both small and daily habit changes alongside collective action that we think systems can be created to support more people. And right now, all of you are part of that creating. Oh, hello. I'm admitting people as we go. <laughs> um, an idea that I've been returning to a lot in the last few months, articulated by activist and abolitionist Miriam Kaba, is that we don't have to build things that last forever. We shouldn't need a project like this to exist in the first place, because free and accessible education and knowledge sharing should be baseline. I started this project as just one of many resources and stepping blocks on the way to greater equity in the physical skills-based fields of predominantly craft and design. It already feels like this project is growing and shifting to serve everyone who would like to participate. And it is a dream to be part of this collective building project with you all. This model works, that is allowing anyone who wants to participate for free, including materials, because we are collecting all the dollars into one pot and then redistributing them back out. We believe that everyone contributing in accordance with their wealth and privilege is one way to achieve a more equitable social system. And it has been really exciting to watch this happen in real time as you all are making it happen. We can build a framework, but if you are not here to participate, then it doesn't work. So thank you for being here. Um, Reminder, all proceeds from our ticket sales and donations through our website are going to Arts Business Collaborative and Map for Youth, which is a mutual aid project. If you feel strongly about our work, then we do invite you to donate through the website. And also through Eventbrite today, the donations will still be up through the end of the weekend, which is right now. Um, I am going to be the admin for this workshop. Please feel free to drop me any questions into the chat box or drop them into the chat box for everybody or DM me separately if you don't want your message going to the whole group. Um, I'm going to have my sound muted, but we'll be chiming in in real time. Uh, if any of your questions seem pertinent to the discussion or need answering in the moment, and if not, just saving them for a little bit later when there's a little break with Swati. Um, and if your questions don't get answered, then I'll still be collecting them and Swati will follow up in an email um, later. Um, also, la -da 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 -da, Swati would love your participation, of course. So please keep your videos on. Um, we would love to see what you're working on. And since this is a big group, um, if you can keep your sound muted, that would be helpful just for like feedback and sirens and dogs and whatever might be going on in the background. Um, in advance, we do apologize for any technical glitches. This whole Zoom thing is very new to me and to Swati. Um, Please don't hesitate to ping me if you need anything or see something not working and I will do my very best to troubleshoot that in real time. Also, this video is, or this workshop is being recorded. Um, you will receive a link to this recording about a week after the session ends. Um, you can continue viewing it for as long as you want. And on that note, I would love to officially welcome 
Swati, um, who has whose company Foraging Color is pretty new, um, is a sustainable natural dye studio, and Swati is based in Brooklyn, New York. We are, oh, sorry. <laughs> Swati is passionate about working with natural fibers and dyeing them with beautiful dye pigments extracted from plants, flowers, leaves, vegetable pits, and peels, spices, all the things. Um, she works to ensure a zero waste production. Um, Swati is an advocate of slow living, and this dye project aims to embrace nature in our homes and wardrobes, finding beauty in perfect imperfections of the human hand, and create a sense of community by exploring and reviving heritage techniques and craftsmanship. And on that note, I would love to officially welcome Swati Bansal to get us started. Thank you so much, Alison, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to just thank you and just share how much I love you and your work, um, and especially the effort you've put together in the last few months to get this project to life. Um, I know how much work has gone into it, but I'm excited to be part of this initiative. Um, because I think it really resonated with my own life experiences. Um, growing up in a very small town in India, um, and a woman looking to achieve dreams uh, that did not fit the social and gender expectations where I come from, um, it wasn't as easy, I would say, to get here. And I'm still kind of finding my feet and, you know, still trying to figure out things in this industry. Um, I wish I had a platform um, or access to mentorship and access to opportunities and not just learn from my own mistakes alone. Um, so today I'm very grateful uh, to be part of the Level Up project um, and give back in any way I can. And especially thank you to everyone um, who's joined and supported and, you know, showed so much love in the last one month, like Alison said, we are all blown away by your love and enthusiasm. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, it's very humbling, it's very motivating. And um, I especially love um, sharing knowledge because I think we love, we learn from each other so much when we share. So here we are today. Um, gonna dye some uh, neckerchiefs, um, anything what you have using a lot of plant materials and everything what we find around us in our kitchens, in our dye gardens. Um, so yeah, welcome to my dye studio, aka my kitchen in Brooklyn. Um, like you see, natural dyeing really doesn't need a big space or some fancy equipment. All you need is fuel, pots and pans, wooden spoons or tongs and some dye stuff, uh, access to heat and water, and you can really get started on your journey. And that's how I literally started. You know, during the lockdown, um, I needed a distraction. I needed something to learn. I needed to be a part of something, embrace nature, pivot my existing textile studio, a lot of it, and since then, actually, I've just been dying nonstop. You know, to be very honest. And once it's like an addiction. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. The more colors you want to explore, um, and it is um, and it is beautiful because it's sustainable. It's zero waste. You use your kitchen scraps. You now I have a small dye garden. I grow marigolds and roses. So it's and I like pretty things. You know, so. Uh, it's great. Uh, we, we get to work with pretty things and make pretty uh, stuff for ourselves. Um, so yeah, um, let's get started. So what I'm thinking is, let's get going, get straight, dive straight into it. And once our bundles are steaming in the port, uh, then we can chit chat a lot. And you know, I want it to be as engaging as uh, you want it to be. Uh, so I'm happy to answer a lot of questions. I'll touch upon a few basics of natural dyeing, modern dyeing, scouring, but please feel free to ask any specific questions th that you might have. Um, yeah, so let me not talk too much and let's get started. Okay, 
So bundle dyeing. Bundle dyeing is a process where basically it's a very simple process where the plant pigment, the color, is transferred onto a mordant fabric um, using steam. Uh, very simple, but what the essentials are is a well mordanted fabric. Silk or protein fibers are always uh, easier to work with. Um, you can start with that if you're really starting your natural dyeing journey. Um, but if you're a pro, then linen is amazing. Uh, any of the cellulose fibers are amazing for natural dyeing. So today, uh, let's, I am going to dye like a silk neckerchief. It's a pre mordanted fabric, um, nothing special, just a simple white square. Um, before, but before we start, I think what we need to figure out is a bit of color schemes. You know, sometimes, I mean, it's great. Bundle dyeing, you can't go wrong. Every single outcome will be beautiful. You know, that's the way it is and that's the fun part. Um, it can never have a wrong result or there is nothing called wrong. You can throw in anything and the nature works, it's magic, you know, which is beautiful. Um, so we, you can use flowers, a lot of flowers. I, I'm like today, I'm using a lot of marigolds. These are fresh from the garden. And if you have tons of flowers and you can also dry them, make sure you air dry them. Um, and once they are fully dried, then you can store them in containers like these, you know, just glass containers. Uh, but make sure, I've made this mistake, make sure they're fully dried, air dried and in like a dark spot so that, you know, sunlight doesn't uh, take away the color. Sometimes it fades uh, the beautiful, delicate color. And once they're air dried, then you can just store them in mason jars for future use, especially when winter is coming, you won't find these beautiful flowers. So yeah, I'm good. You can use any flowers. These are marigolds. These are some uh, dried rose petals, um, any roses work. Uh, these are some zinnias, uh, beautiful. I got from the farmer's market yesterday. This is one of my favorite ingredients, the onion skins, you know, easy to get. You always have it in your pantry. I don't throw a single piece. It's just like gold for me. So I collect all of them. Um, you, can, you, you can also make an onion dye, like a vat dye, or you can use it for bundle dyes. They leave beautiful imprints um, on fabric. Um, I also use turmeric, which is one of my favorite ingredients. Um, you don't need much, a little goes a long, long way. Um, some more fresh flowers. I have these beautiful pansies from my garden. Um, these are hydrangeas. Um, they give a beautiful blue color. Um, I store them. This is just chamomile tea, basically. You know, I sometimes put it in my bundle dyes and I sometimes put it in my teacup. So. Um, feel free to use any tea that you might have. Um, oh and, yeah. And so I'm, getting, um, I'm getting a question about um, dried versus fresh and just confirming that it's better to have mostly dried or is the combination okay? Um, actually both. You know, I love to work with fresh flowers, um, not just because it's pretty, but you can really see the color of the flower, once it dries, sometimes it really tends to darken. Um, but when you steam it, you actually see the color like hibiscus. If you see hibiscus, they are really dark in color. But when you steam it, it gives a beautiful pink fuchsia color. But in fresh flowers, and also you can test a flower whether it will give a color or not using fresh flowers. You just pick some leaves and if it is like, a dry, a wet uh, cloth, just rub on it and it will leave a stain. So, uh, but you know, I use both fresh and dried. Uh, whenever I'm not using fresh flowers, I just store them for future use. Um, so yeah, you could use both. There's nothing like different about them. 
Um, so, um, yeah, so these are, yeah, my favorite, favorite ingredient is cochineal. This is like bugs from South America. Um, few of the people who ordered packets will have these, but if not, don't worry. You can find them on like reputed dye or suppliers. Um, so these are bugs which actually grow on cacti. It is pink gold, literally pink gold. Um, a little, again, goes a long way. You don't need much. With this amount, little, little, it's not much, but I can dye at least 50 neckerchiefs in these or more. So uh, yeah, just save these and um, that's my favorite ingredient. Yeah, so in terms of ingredients, um, you can use anything. Eucalyptus gives beautiful flower uh, color. Um, yeah, any flowers. In terms of food, um, these are another beautiful ingredients. I don't use avocado pits. I don't use them for bundle dyes, but they make a beautiful natural dye vat, and it's the easiest to use. Um, I store them. I'd never throw an avocado peel or a pit. So for pits, I clean them thoroughly. Make sure there is no, any, no flesh on the pit because that affects the color of the dye. So clean them thoroughly and I store them in the freezer. And when I have like at least 10 to 15 pits, uh, I can make a dye back. And uh, you can, with these, you can dye like pillowcases, big fabrics. But if you're just dyeing the scarf, I can also use four or five, that's good enough. Uh, but in the, if you have space in the freezer, just store them, they will not lose their color, you will not get, get any fungus or you know molds or anything like that. But with peels, I mean, I don't have a big freezer space and I wish I did, uh, but with peels, I again, air dry them, make sure you have, you've scooped out every piece of flesh uh, and then air dry them and store it in a container. Um, these are my avocado peels. Um, yeah, they're just in the dried and stored in a glass container. Um, so you can also crush them and use them for bundle dyes if you want. Uh, I've tried them not many times, but yeah, it, it does give a beautiful blush color. Um, great, so let's, let's get rolling. Well, I have a few questions about ingredients that people can use. Is this a good time to ask? Yeah. Great. Um, so we have from Daisy, for the, flush, for the fresh flowers, do you remove the petals bef uh, from the rest of the plant? during the process. Um, no, actually I throw in everything. Uh, unless it's like a big sunflower head, though the seeds also give beautiful flowers, but I just kind of roughly tear them and I throw the full flower. Amazing, thank you. Um, Noah asks uh, about using beets. How can we prep them? Um, you know, it's a very good question. Beets, beetroots, right? Yes. Yeah, so they, they give beautiful color, but I would say it's not a color, it's a stain. Um, beetroot, so in terms of, in the world of natural dyes, there are, there are two kinds of dyes, um, something called fugitive and substantive. Um, not to get technical, but uh, there are a few dye pigments or stains like beetroots, which are not color and uh, light fastness. They don't have a good wash and light fastness. That means once you've um, put the color on your fabric, in few days, the color might just fade away completely or will become patchy. Uh, it will, it's not a pigment. It's, so I would, uh, I generally don't work with beets. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of bundle dyes, 
it's such a versatile process. You, if you throw a bit of beets along with other things, um, you won't notice it, you know, it's still fine. Amazing, thank you. Um, Daisy had asked earlier about using dried indigo leaves. Um, and also Noah's asking if you need to ferment indigo. Um, indigo is another huge separate world uh, and I won't call myself an indigo expert. Um, so I, I mean, I can give you an answer, but I can definitely look up things on indigo. I, indigo is like very technical, it's amazing. It's another world altogether. And I'm not yet there to answer that question. That's totally fair. <laughs> yes, it's an entirely different dye process and world. Um, Effie is asking about curry. I don't know if, if they mean, um, I'm assuming curry powder. Hmm, that's interesting. I've never tried it, but I'm sure because it's got amazing spices. It has turmeric, it has curry masala. It's a, so I'm sure it'll work well. Beautiful. And... Uh, um, last question. Oh, uh, and lavender also. Lavender. Yeah, it gives beautiful color. I've used lavender uh, in bundle dyes and um, yeah, you can totally use that. And last question from Noah again. Um, can we do a combination of a bunch of stuff like some avocado pits, some onion skin, some cochineal, etc.? Totally. We're going to do that in two minutes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You can... Perfect. So first thing first, let's put our uh, pot uh, on the stuff so that it gets going with the steam. Um, just a steam pot, nothing fancy. Um, it's filled with water, um, simple plain water, a strainer, like just a kind of steamer, which I insert in it. Um, and this is a lid which I use to cover. That's it. So let's get it rolling on the stove so that we have some steam going. Perfect. Have you used dahlias? Yeah, they give beautiful, beautiful color. I mean, that's amazing to use. Assuming you're just tearing the petals and throwing the whole stem and leaves and everything in there? Yeah, I mean, if, if the head of the flower is really big and it's just green uh, and fleshy, I would not use them. Like the bigger heads like dahlia or um, sunflowers, wherever you feel it's too big, then just avoid it. Gotcha. And it doesn't matter even if you throw it in, it won't ruin your bundle dye. Um, Elena asks, how full should the pot of water be? Sorry? How full should the pot of water uh, be? It doesn't matter. Like, I don't fill it um, a lot so that I don't want my bundle dye to be submerged in water. I just want the steam to go through the strainer. So maybe just a quarter based on how big your pot is. Great. Thank you. Um, for turmeric, uh, Stephanie is asking, for turmeric, will we still need a steamer or a pot full of hot water? You mean to say bundle dyeing with turmeric? Stephanie, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, clarify? Um, I don't know what's possible. Bundle dyeing or, or immerse it, I, I don't know. It's the first time I'm, I'm doing this. Okay, so today we are going to do a bundle dye uh, specifically, but you could also do, and it's a great question, so thank you for asking, what you can also do, I mean, I have plain regular water in the pot, but um, what you also can do is throw in some flowers or whatever you have, rose petals, even turmeric, and it will have its own concoction of color and once you make the bundle and throw it in it will kind of have another effect on your bundles so it the the, the base of the bundles will be the color of your um dye pot mm -hmm. okay. so 
but if you don't submerge it in water and just put it in the steamer, uh, you can actually see the imprints and a lot clearer and you will have a bit of white uh, as the background. So based on what you like, you can experiment, you can try both. Um, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing right. Uh, it's just how you feel. So if you feel like throwing some uh, dye stuff in your dye pod, I say go for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I hope everybody's got their pots on. So let's get our fabric laid out. Um, okay. So what I'm thinking is, um, you know, in terms of color, I really can't decide whether I like bright or muted. I just tend, I'm very moody. So sometimes there are days where I like bright pinks and pink is my favorite. Anybody who follows me on Instagram knows that I love pink. Uh, but anyways, um, so what I'm gonna do is, maybe I'm gonna do one bundle dye as bright colors and I'll do another bundle dye with the more muted subtle colors, if that sounds good to everyone and if time permits. So what I'm gonna do is maybe I'm gonna start with a bright palette. Um, uh, let's use some rose petals. Just throw it on, there's nothing wrong, nothing right. Um, I'll use some chamomile. Again, just throw it in. Um, let me use some fresh pansy. I love it, it's so beautiful. So I'm just gonna throw a full pansy on. Um, I'm gonna use uh, cochineal um, and if you don't have it no no stress at all um, let's just um, grind it I mean for if you if you one more thing here on natural dyeing if you intend to do a lot of natural dyes um, I would suggest keeping all your pots pans um, anything spoon strong separate even though everything is natural, but when we use modented fabrics, we are using um, alum salts and uh, sometimes modifiers. Um, and too much of that is not good. I mean, actually nothing is, it's, it's still metal. So we, we need to be very careful about that. Uh, so keep all your um, equipment separate for natural dyeing. Um, if you don't have a separate mortar and pestle to grind the cochineal bugs into a fine paste, like I don't have at the moment, I'm just gonna use a paper, just put some seeds on it, uh, bugs on it, um, and use a spoon or anything and just make it into a fine powder. As fine as you can get. You don't need much, just a bit. It's very intense in color. Okay. What do Suzanne is asking about um, using eucalyptus? If you use the leaves or the bark for bundle dyeing, um, and if you- Yeah, you can totally use the leaves. Great. And um, Katie is seconding that, but asking what color eucalyptus usually produces? Um, eucalyptus sometimes gives like a rust color or based on how you modented your fabric, it sometimes gives uh, greenish or even blackish tones, like brownish blackish. The thing about modenting and you know, when, as and when you start your journey, you realize that modenting is actually a very very uh, crucial step. The way you modent your fabric can finally decide the colors um, of your bundle dyes or even of your natural dye vats. Um, so yeah, I mean, based on how you've modented it, but it usually gives a beautiful 
um, brownish black or even rust color. Amazing. Thank you. And I know you're going to get into mordening a little bit later and I know you want to get your uh, bath going. Yes, Thank you. for sure. Um, okay, so this is the cochineal and I usually don't wear gloves, but I would highly, re highly recommend wearing gloves if you're using a lot of these things. Uh, I like to use my fingers just to feel things, but you know, for safe, safety comes first. If you're doing a lot of it, then definitely wear gloves. Okay. Um, another ingredient which I really use um, is called ferrous sulfate. It's just iron powder. Um, you can use rusty nails if you don't have this. Uh, people who've got the material have got like a little sachet filled with green looking powder. That's the iron powder. It also acts as a mordant. It, it improves the light fastness and wash fastness of the fabric, of the natural dyed fabric. Um, if, but you have to remember this also, uh, too much of it can actually compromise the quality of your garment or of your fibers because it is quite strong. Um, again, really a tiny, tiny pinch goes a long, long way. It also kind of shifts the color from more vibrant colors to a more, it really saddens the color. So um, even though I'm making a bright color palette, I still use it for kind of um, modenting effect. It's not really modenting, but just to improve the uh, light and wash fastness and the colors tend to kind of bind with the fibers a lot better uh, in my view when I use this. So highly, re highly recommend if you don't use some rusty nails, if you don't have those even pennies, any metal or even anything, just you can just throw anything in. So I'm just gonna use a tiny, tiny bit of that. Um, as you can see, it's like hardly anything, just sprinkle it a bit. Actually, I'm not even gonna use that much. Um, very tiny. About how many pennies or rusty nails would you use instead of the first? Um, around three to four. And sometimes if you're using a rusty nail, it also leaves a beautiful imprint um, on, your fa on your fabric. So it's pretty as well. I tend, whenever I use nails, I tend to throw it along with my dye stuff. So I keep losing them. Um, but so I don't have them on hand right now. But yeah, that's one of my favorite things to use as well. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of done. I uh, just want to check if everyone is where how everyone is doing, if everyone's kind of laid out their vibe fabric. Can y'all give Maybe us I'll like one or two minutes? Am I? I have let a me know question. if I'm going to. Well, I guess a an affirmation. Yeah, who's that? Oh, Effie. Yeah, hi. Yeah. So on my, I have linen. Okay. Um, I have. Turmeric, chamomile, hibiscus, the ferrous sulfate, um, and then I have like these little buds from a dry flower. I can't remember what the flower was. That's fine. Just throw it in. Okay. How was the flowers? And that should be good. So you, your fabric is linen, you said? Yes, I have like these leftover linen bags from ordering fabric. And you've already mordanted them? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so just throw it in, just make a layout. Are you doing it together or are you gonna be doing it later? Later, I, I kind of wanna watch and then okay. so I don't make mistakes. Perfect. No, <laughs> perfect. Um, so it sounds good. You've got the perfect ingredients. Just go very gentle on ferrous sulfate. It's very strong. You don't want your bags to have a hole in it. It can actually damage the fibers. So very, very little um, is good. Um, 
Great. Noah's so, asking if they should have their dyes on the stove now. Sorry. Should um, should we have our dyes on the stove now? Yeah, our stove is already on, so it should be having steam going. Uh, if you've already rolled up your bundles, then you, you feel feel free to like put it in. I'm still gonna roll it. Um, so what we are gonna do is, now we're gonna gently roll mm -hmm. the, you wanna roll it and make sure it's as tight as possible because when your bundle is tight, that's when you get the beautiful imprints from your flowers and leaves. Um, actually, I'm also gonna put the marigold. And can we be using wet fabric or dry only? Um, doesn't matter, you know, I, uh, you can actually wet it or put it on dry, really. Uh, I like to use dry because it's easier to roll and I can actually see what's going on. But if you want to wet it, spray, you can also spray it with vinegar, put it in, put normal distilled vinegar in um, like a spray bottle, spray it with uh, uh, your fabric with it before putting any of your dye stuff. Vinegar also helps to kind of brighten the colors and also helps kind of uh, take the pigment onto the fibers nicely. So a lot of people use vinegar. I might use vinegar as well. I have a simple vinegar in this jar. Um, so actually let's do that. I'm gonna dip my bundle into the vinegar solution later, but you can totally wet it uh, with tap water or with uh, vinegar before putting any dye stuff on it. Okay, so let's get rolling. Um, bit more. Okay. Then you want to just kind of make it into a bundle as tight as possible. Um, you can use like a rubber band or anything to tie with it. I'm just use, gonna use some natural twine to tightly kind of tie it. Please make sure it's really tight because that's gonna really give beautiful imprints. Okay. Okay, so that's a bundle. This is just some vinegar. Dip it in. I wanna make sure it's completely wet. Just a minute, just so that it absorbs a lot of the solution. You can already see the uh, water is going a little pink from the cochineal bugs. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, and I'm just gonna pop this into our steamer. Um, Alexa, put a timer for 30 minutes. Alexa mm -hmm. is my virtual dying assistant. Uh, so it reminds me of the timer. Um, great. So that's, let, I think because it's a small fabric, uh, 30 to 35 minutes should be good. The longer you keep, the better it is. Um, so yeah, I, if you wanna open your bundle dies in 30, 35 minutes, it's great. 
e even if because it's small, it still come out beautiful. Uh, but if you want to keep it longer, it's up to you. I usually kind of tend to steam it for a couple of hours uh, when I'm doing commissioned work. Um, and I also put a lot in the steamer. So a uh, couple of hours should be good for bigger pieces. But if it is smaller, um, 30 minutes minimum. Uh, so today I'm going to open in 30 minutes, but otherwise uh, one hour to one and a half hours is good. Um, so let me just quickly, I hope everyone is doing okay and everybody's um, rolling their fabric and putting it in the steamer. Like I said, let me kind of make another one um, just so that we see how different colors and different palettes can um, be achieved. Again, Marigold is my favorite, it's in season. Um, I love to use everything what's in the season um, because it's just nice, it's fresh, it's, um, yeah. You find it in your garden, in your surroundings. Um, and it's, it's just a way of expressing yourself. So whatever colors you like, um, go for it. And eventually, the more you practice, you will develop your own color palette and your own way of doing. And that's beautiful. Okay, so nothing fancy, just some um, marigolds. There are two, three different kinds of marigolds, but that's okay. It's beautiful. Um, let's throw some chamomile. Um, okay. Maybe we should do some iron powder. Again, very little. We just want to make sure that it binds properly and we improve the color and wash fastness. Um, yeah, maybe I'll put some turmeric. Again, turmeric is very strong, gives a lot of color, so And also depends, you know, the more you practice, the more you'll know about how much of each ingredient is enough. I would always say uh, less is more, but you know, you just have to figure out what you like. Um, and then, uh, yeah, keep trying. It's just every, every result is beautiful. And that's the fun part of bundle dyeing. There's no stress. Um, that's it. I'm just going to roll this again tightly as tightly as possible. And for this particular bundle dye, it looks like you put in about a teaspoon of turmeric, of powdered turmeric. Is that right? Uh, what went into it? Yeah, I'm just like for people who weren't looking at the screen. Yeah, so it's um, just a few marigold petals, a little bit of turmeric. Um, what did I put? I tend to just throw in stuff. Yeah. Um, I think I put some chamomile and some <laughs> iron powder. <laughs> um, with the I, for this amount of cloth, you put in about like half a teaspoon maybe of, of dried turmeric powder? Of turmeric powder, maybe one fourth. A quarter teaspoon, okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. yeah, not much. Um, but if you want the fabric to be more yellow, uh, then you can totally increase the uh, quantity. Thank you. I'm not happy with it. It has to be a bit tighter. And do you have any techniques for twisting up that bundle that you can share? Um, you know, again, with me, I don't have like specific recipes. It just what I'm feeling, how I'm feeling, and I just tend to do stuff, you know, whatever makes sense. And I think the good part about bundle dyeing is the more you experiment, uh, the more you'll figure out how each step can give you a different result, and which is beautiful. And um, 
one thing I've learned in this process is sometimes you have a picture in your mind. You want you you want your neckerchief to look a certain way. Um, you try and do everything to make it work, but it just completely when it comes out, it's completely different. And that's magic. I've learned to embrace a lot of not imperfections, they're not really imperfections, but I've learned to embrace a lot of um, uh, the natural processes. Uh, so it's just a matter of experimenting, uh, continuing your practice. Um, yeah, but in terms of technique, I really don't have a technique. I just end up rolling it and then twisting it and making it into a different bundle but you could also do is just gently fold it in like squares if you don't want to roll it the most important thing about creating a bundle is that once you have like a small piece to tie it as tightly as possible so that the bundle is tight and you have beautiful imprints of your dye stuff on the fabric that's really essentially the most important part um, but yeah i think you know um invention is always comes from trial and error and mistakes not really mistakes so um yeah we can definitely try different techniques and uh, see the result can we use um twine to tie the bundle uh, yeah you can use twine or rubber bands or anything. Um, Vivian's asking why soak in vinegar. Can, can we use water instead? And if, yes. if somebody doesn't have vinegar, will it affect light fastness or anything other than the color transfer? No, no, it's totally fine. And even if you still want to use it, just squeeze a lime into water uh, if you don't have vinegar. And if you still want to do that, you can also squeeze lime or lemon into water and just dip into it. And if you don't have lime or lemon in your fridge, no stress, just plain water is good. Because you're already putting uh, rusty nails or ferrous sulfate, like the iron powder. Um, so it should, and if you've mordanted your fabric well, um, it should be fine. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's my second bundle. Gonna dip it in. One second. And the rusty nail should go directly into the packet, into the bundle? Yeah, just throw it in, just along with your dye stuff. Should the fire um, be medium heat or high for the 30 minutes? I, I, I usually started with high and as soon as we have steam, um, I kind of put it to low or medium. But the main point is we should have enough steam going. Thank you. Okay. Gonna put this in. And even if you're dipping it into your vinegar solution or plain water or anything, just make sure your bundles are wet uh, before you put it into the steamer. So. And so far we are just bundle dyeing, right? There's no dye bath happening. Is that correct? No, no. So this is just plain regular water, uh, which is steaming the bundles. Uh, sometimes I also tend to um, put the bundles directly into the water, um, plain water, not even like a dye bath. Um, it's just a slightly different effect. Uh, it's kind of more, um, the imprints are not as clear, but it's just like kind of a cosmic effect uh, on the fabric. So uh, trial and error, and you'll always get a different beautiful result. So, um, okay, just wanna make sure everyone's doing okay and everyone's 
bundles are in the dye pot or not dye pot, the strainer or the steamer. Uh, or if any questions before we kind of talk a little more about uh, natural dyeing, modern thing, anything you would like to know. So be good. Um. We will definitely get more to mordanting in a little bit, but most of this workshop is not going to be about mordanting. That is like a whole separate thing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll definitely give a brief overview on mordanting. And also I think my guide, which I think everyone's gotten, um, has detailed instructions on just how to start your journey when you're um, starting your modern journey. It's got basic recipes, uh, both for protein and cellulose fibers. Um, that should really start you uh, on your journey. Um, so for, mo for me, modern thing is like uh, baking. It's like so scientific. It's like the, the weight of the fiber ratio to uh, to the temperature of the water, to the pH levels of the water, a lot uh, dictates how your final result is. Um, bundle dyeing is more fun. You know, you can throw a bit of this and whatever you have around and it's still beautiful. But we can do beautiful bundle dyeing only when you have a good modented fabric. So that's a key step. Um, uh, in terms of uh, so we talked a little bit about how to get going on your journey, how to set up your studio, the basic equipments uh, you might need. Um, in terms of fibers, uh, natural dyes tend to take color um, beautifully on natural fibers, which means like no synthetic uh, fibers, uh, fibers which come from either plants or animals, which is so animal fibers are called protein fibers, like your wool. Um, silk, um, and your cellulose fibers are more plant-based fibers, which is like linen, cotton, hemp, banana, anything of that. Um, silk animal proteins are a little better to work with uh, in, the, in a way that they um, accept color beautifully and easily, even if you're doing VAT dye baths. Um, the evenness you get on uh, the fibers is much better versus cellulose. Uh, but cellulose is beautiful as well. It, it, the modernting of cellulose fibers is a little more tricky than your silk and wool fibers. Um, but once you've modented your cellulose fibers, then it's the same thing. Um, whether you do bundle dyes or dye baths, um, but I would definitely recommend using only natural fibers uh, when you're doing your natural dyeing or bundle dyes. Um, so that's on the fibers. Um, when you're starting your journey, uh, I think it's very, very important to document um, everything. Um, I usually document um, how much dye stuff I'm using, what's the temperature of the water, you, you know, you can get like a candy thermometer um, just to check the temperature. I just use this, you know, nothing fancy. I just had it and I continue to use it, but Amazon, you can easily order your uh, thermometers. Uh, if you really want to do a go a little more scientific about it, you can also order these pH strips, uh, which will tell you the pH levels of the water. Um, you, the pH goes from alkaline to uh, acidic to alkaline and, you know, you can each, um, so the pH level of the water is very, very important in determining, uh, the final color, whether it's bundle dyes or your natural dyes. So I tend to sometimes check the pH levels, especially if I'm doing a client's work because, um, and if I'm trying to achieve a specific shade, uh, but if you're trying to just uh, experiment and um, make something, just embracing all colors, then you really don't need it. But highly, highly recommend just so that you know what affects the natural dyeing uh, process. And pH definitely does. Um, the water you use, um, 
just the, I use the regular tap water, but even the uh, mineral composition in the water, uh, where the water comes from, can affect your final um, dye bath colors. Um, so that definitely use stainless steel pots. Um, you can also use aluminum pots, but um, if you're trying to achieve a particular color, the aluminum pots acts as mordants and they can affect the final color. Um, so if you want to be a bit more in control of your uh, process, definitely use stainless steel um, so that uh, you're removing any variables which can affect the color you're trying to achieve. Um, I use these regular wooden spoons, uh, keep them separate. You can see a lot of color on it already. Um, then, um, so yeah, these are the factors which affect your natural dyeing process. Um, I'm not so picky in terms of trying to get a particular shade of color only. Um, I keep an open mind um, where all the colors come out beautifully from natural dye stuff. Um, so yeah, just embrace nature, just embrace all the colors. Uh, it's not a stressful process, it's a fun process. So uh, unless you're doing um, a commission work for clients and you're trying to achieve a particular shade, then I think you need to kind of really be a little scientific about it. But you need to document, like I document, um, this is like a little document kind of um, book, just the shades I've achieved. These are the modifiers, how much uh, duration I kept uh, the dye stuff in, what's the modifier use, what, what was the pH, how did I scour and mordant um, the fabrics. It just kind of uh, gives you and little swatch cards, which you can see um, on different fabrics. This is cotton, this is silk. Um, so the same dye bath, same process everywhere. Uh, then there's a little difference between your animal protein and uh, animal um, protein fibers and the cellulose fibers. There's definitely a different shade, as you can see. Um, so it's good to uh, document everything. Um, Swati, I have a couple questions about mordanting. Would now be a good time? Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, Suzanne had asked if, if they need to be careful with mordanting, mordanting temperature for raw silk. And related, Stephanie wonders what temperature range might work, I think, for really anything. Yeah, so when, when you actually, it's a great question. Um, uh, especially when you're working with silk fibers, uh, both mordanting and scouring, um, I do not typically go above 85. Sorry, I'm still in Celsius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 85 Celsius is how much? Uh, no idea, but people can figure it out. <laughs> uh, 180. Cool. Uh, sorry, it's my British... Uh, um, uh, mentalism, but um, 85, you don't want to go above 85 because it's silk, it's still kind of delicate fibers and um, you want to protect the sheen and the uh, luster of the fibers. Uh, so between 60 to 85, I would say, not more than that. It should never boil. And what, um, what would be the range for linen? Um, you know, I actually, for scouring, I usually do 60 to 65 for linen and, um, mordanting, I might go till 90, 85 to 90, but definitely do not, you don't want to cook your fibers. Um, Katie was wondering, well, first of all, is it a no-no to mordant everything in, uh, in her bathtub? And also what mordant modifier will make the darker greens, uh, like greens and blacks? 
Um, I would definitely recommend having separate ports if you want to keep continuing your journey. If you just want to do one thing, yeah, you could use your bathtub. I would still say no. I'm sure your landlord won't be happy with that. But um, have a separate dedicated port uh, for your modern thing. And uh, for your second question, I feel um, I've tried in my practice, I've used iron, again, ferrous sulfate, uh, to achieve a bit more muted, darker colors. Um, if you're modenting with iron or using iron in any of your dye pots, I would recommend having a dedicated pot just for iron because iron tends to contaminate other dye baths if you're using the same pot. Sometimes we don't clean it properly. Even a tiny bit can affect the dye color uh, substantially. So recommended uh, a separate uh, pot for iron recommended if you really want to continue your journey and using iron a lot for modern day or for dye baths. Um, Amazing, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions about silk also, but I wonder if perhaps you want to keep going and um, then we'll return. Yeah, I think let's also, before we keep going, just kind of turn our bundles into the steamer. Just kind of flip them so that they get steam evenly. Um, great. Um, so that's on um, mordanting. Um, yeah, so we've discussed a bit about mordanting different kind of fibers. Uh, silk is the easiest. I just use normal um, alum for um, that was here. Yeah, just a regular alum to uh, modern silk. Um, it's the potassium aluminum sulfate. You can get it from any reputed uh, dye suppliers. I usually buy it from Maiva in Canada. I mean, um, if you, I'm sure you all have heard of Maiva School of Textiles and Maiva School of Dye. Um, they do amazing work and they're very inspirational. So uh, you'll find a lot of um, materials and guidance and tutorials on their website. So definitely check them out. And you can also order your supplies from them. Uh, even though they're based in Canada, they're very quick and you get your dye stuffs on time. Another very good resource for your dye stuff is Botanical Colors. Um, I order a lot from them as well um, for dye stuffs. Uh, this is aluminium acetate, um, which I use to mordant. Um, this is from Botanical Colors. This is... Put that around, Swati. It was upside down. Is this good? Okay, so this is aluminum acetate from Botanical Colors, uh, used to modern uh, cellulose fibers. You can use alum, but the intensity and the depth of color you achieve when you use aluminum acetate on cellulose fibers is way better uh, versus alum. Um, alum is great for silk fiber, uh, protein fibers. Um, Aluminum acetate along with a dye bath of tannins or a, a after bath of, sorry, I'm getting a bit technical. So please stop me if, if it's a too much information. Uh, but cellulose fibers always require a ten, tannin uh, dye bath before your mordanting step. And after mordanting, it also requires um, after bath of either calcium carbonate or chalk or um, wheat bran, uh, just to kind of fix um, the mordant to the fibers. Um, 
I usually um, more have like specific days for modern thing because you have uh, various steps involved. Also, another thing about modern thing is once you've modernated your fiber, a few uh, you need to kind of give few days to kind of cure the fiber because um, the longer you keep, few of the dye colors. Um, if the fabric is modernated just a day before versus a fabric which was modernated maybe six weeks ago or four weeks ago, it can vary uh, the color. So that's, again, the more you practice, um, you will kind of uh, figure that out. But sometimes few of the uh, dyes need um, a cured modernated fabric because um, it's still kind of a natural living, breathing color. Um, so it kind of develops over time. You might the see the shades might... become a bit darker. Sorry. Sorry, so the color might be more intense if it's, if it's been modernated like six weeks prior. Uh, six, uh, yeah, six weeks, um, yeah, exactly. Six, I mean, it's six is just a number, but at least four to six weeks or something. Yeah. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so I have specific days usually where I do all the modern uh, modernting together and then label them uh, when I have modernted, how much was the quantity, the weight of fiber, any small detail which you can think of, uh, label them and then store them nicely um, in a dry place. Um, and then, yeah, whenever you want to kind of dye, then just use that. Um, in terms of uh, modifiers, we have uh, tons of modifiers as well. Uh, sorry. And Swati, as just a timekeeping, we're about 15 minutes out. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let's take out our bundles. Uh, we can explore. Uh, you can keep your bundles in the steam. Let me take out the bundles and we can then uh, see yours as well. I would always recommend wearing gloves. It's damp hot, so you don't want to burn your fingers, which I have done a lot in the past. And I don't seem to learn, but uh, yeah, it's a slow process. So please have some patience. Um, I'm gonna try and open them. This is the first bundle, which I did. Um, and this is the moment we've been waiting for. So fingers crossed. I am always very impatient, so yeah, I can't wait to see it. Okay. Okay, so you can see a lot of pinks, a bit of yellow. I haven't used too much of the white here because I kind of like when it's all kind of turned around, it's a bit of the white and the color. So you see a lot of these cochineal bugs which have shown uh, their color. You also have these beautiful marigold or the turmeric imprints. You also, the black is from the rose. Alexa, stop. Sorry about that. We were very impatient and we took it out a bit early, but that's okay. Um, then you have these rose imprints, uh, which you can see. These are the rose imprints. 
And wherever you have this kind of little dark color, this is all um, uh, the ferrous sulfate. So yeah, this is a more kind of um, the brighter tones. I kind of like it. And there you go. That's your first. Um, Swati, how large are the fabric pieces when you steam that you steam for two hours when you make a commission? Vivian was wondering. Oh. Sorry, I think you need to unmute yourself. That was my bad. Uh, can everyone hear me? Sorry, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, you were asking something. Sorry, yes. Um, Vivian was wondering how large are the fabric pieces that you steam for two hours when you're making a commission? Um, that actually depends on the commission itself, but sometimes if it's like, uh, two meter pieces, uh, you know, they are two meters um, in length and 55 in width. Uh, so they're pretty large. Or if they are smaller pieces, but I have at least 20 bundles going at the same time in the bundle uh, in this pot, uh, then I tend to keep it a little longer. Um, yeah. And how do you, um, how do you wash these after they're done? Steaming? Yeah, so I was coming to the aftercare. It's very, very important. Like we discussed, the pH affects the final color of your neckerchiefs. Um, so if you use a soap, which is not pH neutral, it can still change the color of your neckerchiefs even though you've kind of bundled them and finished them, it can even change the color at a later date. So it's very important to use like a pH neutral uh, soap to kind of wash them. As soon as I open the bundle, I do not wash them with uh, soap. I would just kind of gently let them air dry it. Um, do, I do not even wash them. Uh, I just kind of remove the dye stuff uh, air dry them, uh, iron them on a very high setting, as high as you can get, even though silk um, is delicate and you want to preserve uh, the quality of the silk fibers. Um, uh, I would put a cloth between the silk and the iron, uh, but I would use the uh, highest setting possible for uh, uh, for silk. Uh, and once you've ironed them, iron tends to kind of really uh, make the color permanent on the fiber. Once you've ironed them, uh, then I would just wash it with a pH neutral soap and uh, yeah, and then it's ready to use. Great. Um, can you machine wash mordanted and hand dyed linen napkins with the rest of your laundry? Maria was wondering. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, I, I usually don't do that, but uh, yeah, I don't want to kind of, because natural dyes sometimes do tend to bleed, um, even though they might not adhere to your other fabrics, but I won't take a chance, especially if it's turmeric or, you know, any of those things. Um, I always kind of wash them separately, put it in a bucket and hand dye them. Um, uh, Suzanne was wondering if you have to use a ferrous sulfate, will it last if it is mordanted and dipped in vinegar? No, you don't have to use ferrous sulfate. Um, you don't have to use rusty nails at all. Um, it's just a personal preference. I like a bit of kind of uh, a little dark earthy spots um, on the fabric, but you don't have to use it at all. Um, even vinegar, I mean, if you well mordanted your fabric, 
Um, I don't think you need to use these, but it's just a way vinegar helps to kind of bring out the colors of your dye stuff uh, and make, makes it a bit more vibrant in my practice, um, but it's totally not a crucial step at all. Is there a, a special way to clean the dye pot between uses? Uh, no, I just use my regular um, kitchen brush and just some soap. Uh, yeah, but it's very important to clean them regularly so <laughs> that you know, it doesn't have deposits of your dye stuff and contaminate the dye baths later. Um, so this is the other yellow, uh, which is a more muted, more different kind of palette. So if you, you can see, I mean, there were common uh, ingredients between the two, but the color effect is completely different. Um, it had both had ferrous sulfate, both had marigolds, both had um, turmeric, um, both had chamomile. Um, but just the way you do it, sometimes the cochineal just reacts with other kind of uh, dye stuff and makes it completely different uh, versus this. Uh, so the way you use your dye stuff and the color combinations, you can literally achieve a rainbow of colors. That looks amazing, Swati. Um, Suzanne and Cindy were both wondering a little bit about silk. Um, can you talk about using raw silk at all and also where you purchase? Also, I think you'll be sending out an email with some sources for supplies after, so maybe that will just be on there. Yeah, I mean, um, raw silk is beautiful. Uh, you can definitely use it. It takes the color on beautifully. It has a beautiful texture. Um, I usually buy my fabrics from India uh, because I have my textile studio. So I usually work with my own weavers, but uh, um, yeah, I think there's, I, I can send some sources where you can purchase your uh, fabrics locally. Great. Thank you. Um, and everybody, we have a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Um, feel free to drop any questions in the chat box. Um, and uh, yeah, and Swati will get to those. If we don't get to all of your questions now, um, Swati will follow up with an email later. Um, should everybody be taking their bundles out now? And also, can we see that pansy imprint? Yeah, let's see if it has like really come uh, distinct. Well, I feel this is where the pansy was. You can see a bit of purple. A bit of purple and blue. It's, it's not an eco print, so you will never have a very clear pansy or any kind of flower imprint, like a clear one. That's a different process where you actually kind of imprint the flowers separately on the fabric. Um, in bundle dyes, it has slight imprints, but it kind of tends to mix with other imprints. So you will never find a specific uh, imprint in my practice, the way I do it. Um, yeah, but that's like where you imprint, you have specific imprints of eucalyptus leaves or uh, pansies or other flowers. It's, it's called eco printing and it's a beautiful, beautiful process as well. Thank you. And um, in terms of modifiers, um, there are various modifiers, like we talked about the pH levels, uh, which affect the colors. Um, so in case, say, suppose you're not very, you, it's too vibrant for you. So what you can do is you can just make a small um, iron water. You can just put some regular water. This is vinegar, but just regular water put like a teaspoon of iron sulfate in it. That's your iron water or rust water. Just dip that in. And the moment you're happy with the color you wanna achieve, it definitely mutes and saddens the color. Um, 
just take it out, rinse it properly, and you've changed the look of your color, of your uh, bundle dye. So these are modifiers, iron water, uh, soda ash. Soda ash makes the water alkaline. Uh, you can use citric powder, which makes it um, acidic. So it makes the color pop even more vibrant. Um, so yeah, you can definitely use modifiers as well in your practice. I want to kind of show you a few more in case um, you want to get a little more inspired. Um, so this is uh, kind of a neckerchief, which is made with hibiscus and cochineal and some iron powder. If you can see that. Ah, okay, yeah, this is better. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, cochineal, hibiscus, and some iron powder. Um, this is just onion skins. Um, if you can see. Do you want to put it down on the ground? Is that easier? Yeah, the ground has all the dye stuff. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so this will be way better. Okay, so this is all onion skins and um, just on plain background. Um, then you have this beautiful uh, purple. This is with logwood. Um, chamomile, um, some turmeric, um, and some other flowers, uh, whatever you have on hand. That's a purple one. Um, this is my favorite. That's got like ton. It's dyed several times, not just once bundle dyed. It's over dyed to kind of achieve this look. Um, you have uh, lots of pinks and yellows and fuchsia. Um, for the, for the cochineal one, did you put the bundle in water or is it steamed? Steamed. I, I usually don't put it in water, um, but I put um, a lot of linen in water. So that's like um, a linen piece. This is again over dyed uh, several times to achieve this look. Um, is the washed background color achieved with a dye bath? Um, you mean to say this color? Yeah. Yeah. I think so this was like, like an avocado dye bath. Um, this was, this is oh, just kind oh, of a oh. over dyed uh, turmeric and a pink base. Um, this is red cabbage. Uh, with some hibiscus and a lot of other dye stuffs. Um, yeah, so these are a few of the linen uh, swatches. This is really my favorite. Again, uh, several rounds of um, dyeing, um, which achieves this look. Like you say, you, you can see there is no specific imprint per se, which is more an eco print, but each, each dye stuff kind of leaves their mark and creates this beautiful marbled pattern to say. Um, so that's on linen. Um, so yeah. just confirming for anything that has a colored ground, you are putting that in a dye bath first and then you're taking it out and you are doing a dye bundle. No, I, I throw, I make a dump bundle dye, you a bundle, like a normal bundle, oh, okay. and then throw that in a dye bath, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Um, Barbara was asking, how does soda ash modify the color in the after bath? Um, it kind of um, mutes the color a bit. Uh, and it kind of, in my practice, I've seen it takes it a little more on the uh, bronzy, coppery kind of color tones. Amazing. And um, everybody can absolutely email you their end result, right? Yes. And I would love to, if anyone wants to share their uh, results, I would love to kind of see that. 
That's wonderful. Um, everyone, we have about, oh, one minute left. We're going to do like 60 more seconds. Please feel free to throw your questions in the chat box. Oh, um, wow. That looks oh, gorgeous. That looks so good. I'm going to spotlight you, Effie. Oh, my God. That is beautiful. Wow. I love, love it. Is that linen? Yes, this was the linen in the... Love it. I love the color combination. The milk, hibiscus, the Galfio flowers. I looked up the flower that it was. Um, turmeric, lavender, and the, the parasolfate. Nice. I love it. It's just stunning. I love the t-shirt as well. I saw someone showing the t-shirt. Oh my god. Morgan, Maria. Oh my god, that is stunning. Is that yes. is those, yes. what is it? It's Are just, you talking to me? Onion onion skins and like uh mm -hmm. there's some avocado skins and then some also some dried like red cabbage. Awesome. Looks stunning. Yeah. Is it it's my patties on it, like you said. No, it's beautiful. I love it. This is okay, so I just cool. Thank show you. you. I don't even know what these are, but these are, I just found them like somewhere in a park. Oh, wow. And they look like elderberries, are they? I think so. And so like, I use some of those and I just put them in there. Elena says pookberry. Oh, nice. I love the blush pink color and again, the fuchsia. It's stunning. Yeah, so it gave me this, you know, I just put a few scattered around the fabric and I guess, you, you know, I guess they burst and like some of them left like those imprints in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And especially <laughs> when they're dried, it will look even more beautiful. And when you cool. iron them, it's going to look stunning. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it. Thank you, Swati. Thank you, Alyssa. Oh, no, thank you so much for joining us. And it's so nice to kind of really meet you all. It's just amazing. Yeah, so happy. <laughs> Does anyone else want to show what they've got? Yes, Rebecca, Suzanne, Morgan. I'm seeing. I'm sure there will be many. Oh my God. Sorry. My muted. Don't be shy. I'd love to see. Um, if you can maybe start talking, if you want to show Rebecca. Yes, Morgan. I'm gonna spotlight Morgan right now. Woo. Oh, oh, wow. wow. That is stunning, Morgan. Wow. That is amazing. What all did you use? Thank you. I love it. I cannot believe how well it turned out. It is, it looks stunning. I can't tell you how beautiful it's gonna look, especially once you dry it, iron it, yeah. and wear it. It'll be stunning. Anyone else wanna show what they've got and any ingredients? Like raise your hand or start showing us the fabric. I can show mine. I don't know if the light is oh. Olu, yes. Spotlighting you. Oh, wow. Olu. I love it. That looks so good. Is it turmeric? Mm -hmm. Is it turmeric? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. It's stunning. <laughs> wow. Thank you. So Olu, what did you now to wear? Yay. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyone, anyone else want to hold up a fabric? Ooh, Chris. Yes, I'm spotlighting you. Hold on. <laughs> oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, those colors. That is stunning. This what is all did you use? I'm quite envious of yours. So this is uh, turmeric. Some of uh, these petals right here. I crushed up a little bit of the, the cochineal as well. Um, mm -hmm. I used everything in the kit actually now that i think about it but oh yeah, it's, very, it's very, very, very i must happy tell with, you yeah very happy with this that looks awesome awesome anyone else want to show what they got and then and continue please dropping any last questions you got like 30 seconds to get those questions in the chat box before we tap out um anyone else want to hold up a thingy oh wait rebecca do you we do you want to show yes oh wow Look at that. Whoa. <laughs> so good. It is stunning. Yeah, That's I used some wild sunflowers. I'm excited to try another one with more wild sunflowers. Wow. It is beautiful. Thank you so much. 
No, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Everybody, thank you so much. And Swati, as we are heading out, um, where can people find you, keep up with you, see more of your work? Are there any projects that you're working on that you'd like to share? Um, you can definitely find me on Instagram. It's called Foraging Color um, for my natural dyeing journey. Um, I have a small textile studio which is focused on uh, weaving uh, with artisans in India. It's called Soyuja Studio, so you can find me there as well. My email, I hope everyone has my email already, so you can email me. Um, I am so excited and so thrilled for all of you to have joined me and Alison today. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I have a lot of dye projects going, which is very exciting. I'm making a lot of home um, table linens and uh, duvet covers, which is in the process. Um, I have to figure out a way to do bigger pieces in my Brooklyn, tiny Brooklyn apartment but we'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, you can definitely get in touch with me on either social media or email or yeah, I'd love to be in touch. Amazing. Thank you so much, Swati. And thank you everyone for being here today and participating in our very first workshop series um, with the Level Up Project. I am so thrilled that you all are here. Um, you will receive an email link to this recording um, in about a week as just a reminder so you can refer back to everything that Swati's talking about. Swati is also going to follow up um, with an email to all of you sometime in the next few days, week, I don't want to speak for Swati, <laughs> um, with some more sources, um, supply lists perhaps that might be helpful that she was discussing. Um, and Maria is asking air dried pieces, uh, but not in this air dry pieces, but not in the sun. Just one last question. Yeah, I think um, I would always tend to dry them in. You can dry them outdoors, but not in direct sun. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I'm going to go ahead and end this workshop. It feels a little weird to just be like, OK, peace. But that's what we <laughs> But um, we shall see you all soon. Yes. Thank okay. you, everybody, so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.